Good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, we are really uh, honored to have, privileged to have French ambassador to India, Charles Brander Sigler. He uh, he's been here for almost two years now, and has uh, you know been instrumental in uh, getting bilateral visits from both sides. Uh, Prime Minister Modi, as you remember, he went to uh, France last year, in June last year. Within and was. He will tell you the story, how it was planned uh, at short notice. And we just had a big visit by the President uh, of France, Emmanuel Macron. Uh, to Just to give you a little bit of background about uh, Ambassador Sigler, he is, uh, he's been a star in his foreign service. Uh, I've spoken to several uh, French diplomats uh, and uh, academic, Indian academics who, who've served, uh, or who've, uh, Indian diplomats who've served in France, and they tell me that he's one of the brightest in his, uh, in his uh, service. He, his specialization has been really, China has been one of his main strengths. He knows Mandarin, he's served in Hong Kong as well as in Beijing, and uh, he, he understands Beijing, from the French perspective, better than many of us in this room. Uh, and uh, he's also from a very strong academic background. He studied in three of the most prestigious institutions in, in France, uh, ENS and uh, French National School of Administration and Institute of Political Studies, which essentially to put it in perspective, provides or accounts for 90% of the elite academia, politician, thinkers of France. So from Jean-Paul Sartre to uh, President Macron to Roma Rolla, everyone has studied in one of the three institutions. I don't know if it's a compliment. But <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Thank you, Ambassador, once again. Welcome to the Indian Express. Mm, we just, uh, you know, this is a very, uh, you know, uh, interesting backdrop in which we are having a conversation. And uh, we have senior editorial team from the Indian Express. Everything that you say is on the record, unless it's specified. If you say something off the record, we, we respect that. Uh, but majority of the conversation we'll have is on the record. Um, and as I told you earlier, that it will be brought out full page in one of the Sundays, one of the subsequent Sundays. So let's kick off the conversation. We just had a big visit, and you're relieved. And how how different is President Macron's visit from the previous presidential visits from France? Well, it was um, it was an exceptional visit. Um, we had planned it very carefully, we had worked a lot, we had had time to prepare it and um, I was quite certain that it was not going to be a failure but you never know what is going to be a success and uh, I, I must say that it, was, it turned out to be more than a success. Uh, it was from our perspective um, from our official perspective, but also uh, the way it was perceived by the French public opinion, uh, it was an outstanding visit. Uh, an outstanding visit because the substance uh, was here. Uh, an outstanding visit because the personal relation, the, the chemistry between our two leaders uh, went on exceptionally well and an exceptional visit because it, it, it's been also an occasion for uh, President Macron to engage not only with official India uh, which was the core of the visit but also, also with the people of India uh, and the symbolic part of the visit the, the symbolic parts of the visit uh, the uh, encounters uh, he made with the youth, with students, with uh, uh, artists, 
uh, with the people in the street, uh, even on a very improvised manner, uh, was for him a very striking experience. And I think has added a lot uh, to the quality of the of the visit. So it's it's uh, all in all, uh, I would say that it was from our perspective more than a success, but 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 truly a, a, an outstanding visit. Uh, let's unpack some of the stuff that happened during the visit. And uh, the key, one of the key headlines from this visit was the uh, you know logistics uh, support agreement. Uh, that uh, the two sides signed. Uh, the French have a strong presence in the Indian Ocean region, and especially in the uh, western part of the Indian Ocean region. And uh, that is seems to be one of the areas where India wanted to develop, you know, uh, expertise or sharing of information and support. So, uh, how much of it is driven by? The, the strong Chinese presence, growing Chinese presence, and uh, in the region? Well, if you allow me, I wouldn't put it this way. What we are building uh, with India uh, is not turned against anybody, or it's not aimed at anybody. Uh, it's a partnership uh, of values, of trust uh, that is built between two nations that are part of the same region and that are confronted with uh, the same challenges. Um, our strategic partnership has been uh, a noble story. Uh, it was officially established 20 years ago. We actually s are celebrating this year the 20th anniversary of the establishment of our strategic partnership. It was like France was actually the first country with which uh, uh, India engaged in such a partnership. But what is, I would say, new in the, the visit uh, of President Macron to India is that we wanted to bring the demonstration that this partnership was not only a conceptual partnership or was not only uh, uh, some kind of political construction, um, but was an operational one, uh, a global partnership, but also a partnership focusing on a region uh, that will be that will be absolutely essential to the security of our two countries, and I would say to the security, whose stability will be essential to the security of the world. Uh, what is special between France and India is that we might look far away uh, from each other, but in reality we are part of this region too. Uh, we have, uh, and we are the only European country, if I may say so, and, 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 and I would say even Western country to be part of this uh, uh, Region, Indian Ocean uh, region. Uh, we have two million inhabitants uh, in this region. Uh, we have territories in this region. Uh, we have uh, economic interests. Uh, we have strategic interests. And we are confronted once again with the same uh, challenges, which are terrorism, uh, which are criminality, uh, which are piracy. Uh, which are uh, securing the freedom of navigation. And I would say more generally, I think the President Macron uh, put it that way. And he was actually quoting uh, the Prime Minister of Australia in saying that, ensuring the freedom of our sovereignty uh, in this region. So that's the reason why we had decided to put a special emphasis uh, on this aspect of our strategic partnership and uh, operational cooperation uh, also uh, in terms of agreements, concrete agreements that were concluded. Uh, two major ones. Uh, one is what we call a general security agreement that will allow us to exchange classified uh, uh, information. 
uh, not only on the region, but also on terrorism, also on all the challenges that our two countries are facing. And the second being, being this uh, logistical agreement uh, that will uh, allow reciprocal access to our bases, naval bases, uh, air bases, not only in the region, uh, all over the world. Now, Mr. Ambassador, two questions. One, uh, the military logistics agreement that India famously signed with the US took almost 15 to 16 years to come through. How were you able to swing it in six months? Uh, th that's question number one. Uh, number two, you know, defense has been a cornerstone of India-France partnership over many decades now. You know, in, even during the Kargil War, the kind of support that, that France provided was unheard of and exceptional in many ways, which no other country has provided to India. Uh, were you surprised by the controversy surrounding the Rafale deal, uh, the, the kind of noise that it has made in India? And I'm particularly referring to the fact that the government came out and said that we cannot share the prices because we have a agreement. We have an agreement with France, which doesn't allow us to a secrecy pact with France, which doesn't allow us to tell the price. Uh, uh, how true is that statement, and where do you stand on that? Well, on your first question on the logistic agreements. It it, it took us uh, around six months to negotiate it. Uh, we launched the negoci negotiation last summer uh, and we ended it um, a couple of weeks uh, before, before the visit. Uh, it's difficult to compare and I don't want to compare with uh, uh, any, any other partners but it went on quite smoothly. Uh, we wanted it to happen. Uh, I think there were, there were a strong commitment from in the Indian side and from the uh, French side. Uh, and once again, uh, it's not an agreement for an agreement. Uh, it, the, the, the operational use, the operational need for this agreement uh, was major, was very important. And that might be the reason why uh, we succeeded in negotiating it in, 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 just, uh, in just some months. On your uh, second question, um, Rafale deal, uh, the Rafale deal is, is, is part of a broader picture, uh, if you allow me. Uh, we've been uh, cooperating on defense uh, and on defense equipment with India for as long as India exists as a uh, country. Um, and the uh, specificity of our cooperation is that we don't see uh, India as a market. Uh, we don't see India as a revenue. Uh, we see India as a partner. And in such a project, like in all the other defense projects we are undertaking with India, we are building on a long-term partnership and we are building a long-term partnership uh, that will uh, of course provide equipment uh, to uh, uh, India, uh, but also a strong level of know-how, of transfer of technology, of localization, why? Because we are, I think, two nations that strongly believe in the notion of the concept of independence. Uh, and uh, we want to be uh, the partner uh, of the uh, strategic autonomy, uh, strategic independence uh, of India. And if you want to be independent, uh, you don't only purchase. Uh, but you will still engage uh, in industrial and, 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 and technological partnerships. And that has always been the way we were seeing our partnership on the defense sector uh, with India. I think Rafale was uh, part of this full picture. Um, it's been... Uh, I was not present in India uh, when it was negotiated. I was in Paris. Uh, I was present when it was when it was signed. So I, I was I was in India during let's say the last six months of the negotiation. It's been a government to government negotiation, tough one, but definitely a win-win one, and I'm convinced of it. 
and what I'm convinced of uh, is that if India has chosen this aircraft, uh, it's uh, because India was convinced that it was the best aircraft possible for the tasks that had to be undertaken uh, uh, in, in, this, in this country. And I'm convinced that they have also chosen this aircraft uh, because the degree of industrial cooperation, the degree of technological cooperation, the degree of confidence in the autonomy they would gain in using this aircraft was quite huge. That's what I call a win-win uh, agreement. Um, but your question on the debate uh, that was uh, launched a, a few months ago on the price. Well, you know, in uh, any major defense deal, there must be some part of confidentiality, uh, be it out of commercial basis, or more importantly, out of security and, 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 and defense uh, necessity. Uh, so I respect the, ne the necessity of keeping of ca some kind of confidentiality uh, on certain elements of the deal. Uh, I don't see any major defense deal in which you could disclose all, absolutely all elements in the public domain. And at the same time, I, I, I'm not only am I convinced, but I know that it's been a very transparent, uh, very serious uh, negotiation, and that there is absolutely nothing to be hide to 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 to, to hide uh, in it. Ambassador, best feeling in some quarters that the French have not been as successful as the English in rehabilitating non European migrants into their country. There's more segregation and they're not part of society. Well, I don't want to draw a comparison between uh, European countries, that would not be fair. And, uh, I'm not in a position to do so. Uh, what I have to say is that we are confronted as a continent. It's not only the case in Europe, but it's definitely the case in Europe. With a uh, uh, huge challenge uh, of uh, uh, controlling migration, uh, and uh, integrating in our societies. And what about this feeling that people who, uh, migrants who come to France do not have uh, the freedom to express themselves culturally and in their, you know, keep their religious identity? I don't know where you're taking this uh, feeling no, from, No, for honestly. example, <laughs> in schools there's a complaint that, you know, um, uh, Muslim, uh, Muslim children are not allowed to follow their religious customs? No, no, not Muslim children, actually. We have a very, very clear regulation that is applying only to public schools in France and that is applying to every religion, be it Islam or Catholic or, or, or Jewish or uh, whatever, is that you don't display what we call a stansible religious symbol at school. Because school is a place, uh, uh, religion is, is, is part of your private life, but school is a place where religion should, should, shouldn't be uh, allowed as uh, a value that could separate actually people and that could antagonize people. So we have a very strict regulation on that matter, which is only applying to public schools. Uh, up to the age of 18. Um, it, 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 it may have raised some controversy, but this is part of our secular, uh, secular, uh, secular tradition. And 
it's definitely not segregating, uh, segregating migrants or Islam or whatever religions. It applies to all kids, uh, uh, be them Catholic or uh, Muslims or, or whatever religion they are. And I don't think it's raising any controversy anymore, to be honest. It's, it's very widely accepted by the population now. Mm. About President Macron, you said before you came here you were in Paris, so you clearly worked with Oram de Mena. There were other presidents. In what way would you say is he different? What's really, you know, in your opinion? Because he doesn't come from the traditional political background of either of the main parties. And so is, has that, A, been a factor? And now you've seen him at very close quarters in foreign affairs. So how would you describe him as opposed to, let's say, earlier presidents, or you don't like comparisons, so then just stick to him? No, no, I'm definitely not going to enter into comparison. Yeah. Uh, how should I describe him? Uh, well, he is my president. It's complicated what you're asking me. Yeah. <laughs> um, he's young, and uh, he conveys the image that the, he can understand the younger generation and that the reform he's undertaking uh, is going to survive them for a long, long time. So he can understand the future and he will be part of the future. Um, he is energetic and he has understood that time had come where the people in France uh, were ready for reform and actually badly wanted reform. He's doing what he said he would, he would be doing. Uh, so not only is he reforming rapidly, uh, but he's sticking to his program. Uh, what he has promised is delivering it. Uh, and uh, I think he was given a clear mandate uh, on that. And as you said, um, he came at a time which is not unique to the French democracy, but which is uh, probably a common factor to many democracies all around the world. Uh, when traditional parties, traditional government parties, uh, were not discredited, but were probably conveying the impression that we had tried them all. Uh, and at a time when people wanted something new. And he was able to capture this uh, dynamic uh, and to um, um, engage uh, in, in a way that was taking the best part from traditional parties, uh, reconciling the country, which had been divided in what had appeared like sterile uh, division uh, between major traditional parties, taking the best from each part and engaging into real work, uh, into a real job, into real reform. So I think he came at the moment and he expressed it quite clearly when he was asked this question, actually, on Saturday afternoon at Bikaner House. Uh, he chosen to engage in politics at a time where politics was at the low level. And uh, he was able to create uh, a dynamic and to portray himself uh, as, as a, not only as a newcomer, but as a person that was bringing a new model, a, a, a new way of doing politics, a new, a new way of ruling a country, a new way of transforming the country. And he's brought a big wave, a huge wave of optimism. And you know in an economy, um, you have a very concrete uh, uh, factors, um, but you have also, not irrational, but uh, 
uh, more psychological kind of factor which is called confidence. Uh, and if all your concrete factors are here but confidence is not here, your economy is not going to grow. Uh, he was able to bring back confidence uh, and that, that's self-confidence to our country and as importantly also confidence in Europe. Uh, so I think that's pretty, that's pretty much the, the secret. <laughs> that's very interesting that you, know, you gave us a backdrop. I would like to bring it back to our bilateral relationship. You know, one, of the, one of the key pillars has been nuclear uh, cooperation, the civil nuclear energy. And it's been 10 years now that uh, the two sides signed the civil nuclear agreement in 2008 uh, when President Sarkozy was in power. Um, we have a change in government in both sides and uh, we've seen the nuclear liability issue uh, coming as a hurdle and also in especially in Jaitapur's case it's the land acquisition has also been a challenge uh, you think now again we have signed the way forward agreement industrial right? uh, industrial agreement yes mm. so uh, you know when is the actual work going to start, number one. And number two, uh, have you finally resolved the land acquisition issues that, uh, and protests that facing uh, at the site together? You, you're right. We've been talking about this project for many years. But we had achieved uh, two years back uh, during President Hollande's visit uh, a major milestone which was this roadmap uh, with a major decision that was to go for six CPR uh, and not two plus some additional. It was quite a change uh, in the economic model and the industrial model of the project. What you can commit for six is not the same as what you can commit for two in terms of transfer of technology, in terms of localization in terms of tariffs uh, and, and, and so on. What we signed last week between NPCIL and EDF uh, is another major milestone. It's what we call the industrial agreement uh, that uh, uh, reach, reaches an agreement on the overall industrial scheme of the project, which is major. We, we're talking about 10 gigawatt uh, a nuclear power plant uh, and getting to an agreement on this industrial scheme was, was a huge part of the work actually. We agreed, we, we agreed on it and it's been signed by, 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 by our two industrials on, 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 uh, on last week. Uh, what needs to be uh, now s definitely solved and clear, which is normal, is the final commercial negotiation on tariffs, on, on credit terms. That's what we're going to do in the coming weeks, actually. Uh, it started already, uh, but we are going to focus a lot of our energy on, on this negotiation. And our common aim, uh, it's clearly stated in the joint statement that was agreed on last Saturday, is to be in a position to conclude the negotiation by the end of this year, so that we can officially start construction uh, by the end of this year. So the timetable is clear. It's 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 political timetable that has been set by, by our, the end of this uh, year. By end this year. It's what, what stands in the joint statement if you read it carefully, which is a public document. On your uh, question on uh, land issues and uh, um, what India is a, is a democracy, and uh, in any democracy, uh, a project of that size, of that scope, uh, has to be discussed. That's quite normal. And uh, what, I, what I'd like to stress is that uh, a key aspect for us in this project will be safety. 
uh, I'm coming from a country where more than 60 nuclear reactors, which means one reactor for every one million French inhabitants, are in operation, in which 90% of our electricity is produced through nucle nuclear energy. A country that has been operating nuclear reactors for almost 50 years. Um, it's part of our landscape. We have a very strong experience uh, and strong safety record. Uh, EPR will be the safest nuclear reactor in the world. And at the same time, I fully understand that it has to be debated and that we have to be fully transpa transparent of the safety uh, criteria that we're going to introduce uh, uh, in India with this, uh, with this EPR. Mm -hmm. I want to ask, I mean, uh, between 2015, 16 and 17, we witnessed a series of, I mean, 17 was still a bit, maybe you can say it was better in terms of the number of incidents that happened. But 15, 16, predominantly we saw a num series of uh, terrorism incidents, uh, say, lone wolf attacks or uh, uh, several of those kinds. I mean, have, been, have you been able to uh, get into the root cause of this sudden rise in uh, in such incidents, uh, some social unrest or whatever? What, what, what are the reasons that, that you could figure out? And how have you been able to, or, or are you looking to address those those issues that you could identify and uh, and to see that uh, there is there is a, a basic harmony and we don't see such incidents coming up? So I'd like to understand something. We are two countries uh, uh, that have been badly hurt by terrorism uh, over the past years. Um, it's been the case in India. Uh, we lost uh, several nationals in the uh, Bombay attacks in uh, 2008. It's been the case in France. Uh, with dramatic attacks that took place in 2015-16. Uh, we, we both know uh, what it is to be confronted, uh, I would say, in our flesh uh, to this uh, threat, which is a worldwide threat. Uh, we are not the only country to be faced, uh, in the world to be faced with that menace. It's been the case uh, all over Europe. Two, being two democracies, two major democracies have been, have been being confronted to this menace. Um, we have to act together. And that's also one of the major parts of our uh, strategic partnership. And that was one of the major part, uh, one major uh, aspect also of the, of the visit. Uh, being more operational uh, in our fight against terror all over the world. Uh, trying to exchange experience, to share know-how uh, on the way we could fight uh, uh, our, this global enemy, uh, including the one uh, which has a name, which is Daesh, uh, how to attack financing, which are also global financing uh, channels uh, fueled by uh, criminal organization, uh, fueled by drug trafficking, fueled by many trafficking in the world. And also, you're right, how to tackle uh, radicalization taking place on our territories. And also this, online. Yes, also, also online. <coughs> Cyber uh, de-radicalization has been one aspect uh, of what we discussed uh, last week. You can always try and, and, and find specific reasons uh, why terror uh, occurs in one place rather than in another. But the reality we are confronted with is a global threat. Uh, it's, it's, it's global groups uh, that want to destroy the values we are standing, uh, we are standing for same values in India and in France, which are democracy, 
which are freedom for everybody, uh, which are uh, our cultures. Um, and that's the reason why I do believe that what is most mo more important uh, uh, that we operationalize our cooperation, we exchange our experience and we concretely and very actively fight uh, against this uh, global threat uh, which is not rooted in one specific village in France or in India uh, but which is a major threat for our democracies. Uh, how do you see the, uh, the Facebook data sharing controversy playing out in Europe? Uh, would you, uh, is there concern that this could probably hit uh, President Macron's very strong artificial intelligence push, uh, 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 you know, given the way the debate uh, might turn? Um, I mean, I, as I said earlier, uh, uh, we are two countries very attached to independence and strategic autonomy. Uh, and part of the debate on strategic autonomy today is the protection of your data. Uh, we have taken a strong leadership on that in Europe. Uh, we are working on this. This is going to be a key aspect of the uh, notion of autonomy and independence in the coming years and decades. And I think that the debates that are taking place in India are very similar to the debates that are taking place in my country and I would say in Europe as a, in, in, in Europe as a whole. Uh, and I think that's going to be a very, very, that's going to become a very, very strategic issue in the, in the years to come. Uh, and we are on the same boat on this and I think we are sharing uh, very similar views. I, I Pardon my ignorance if I am sounding like that, but it's almost 10 years since uh, 2008 uh, economic crisis and then what happened in Euro. Now I think the situation has improved a bit uh, in the last 4-5 years since in 2012 when it started. The great bit, yes. Yeah. But the one thing that uh, looking from outside there was thing that France although it was not in the category of Greece or Spain, but it also was not uh, in a flying color. So, I mean, everyone one was looking towards Germany, not France. So, from look, for people like us who are looking from outside, has French analyzed why they lost out uh, this leadership in industry, economy, uh, or could not retain in a same fashion as Germans have managed to retain? And what are structural changes do you think that uh, uh, your country it, or entire EU is uh, can bring in to address those handicaps? I think that's a fair question. Uh, we've gone through a cri an economic crisis uh, since 2008 and France, al al although it was not uh, uh, never in danger, uh, has been probably more hit than, than, than other countries uh, in Europe. My conviction uh, uh, is that not only are we recovering, uh, but this phase is really over. If you, if you take the latest statistics, uh, growth rate is uh, improving, increasing a lot. Uh, economic prospects for next year are very favorable. More importantly for my fellow citizens, uh, unemployment uh, has started decreasing and actually the number of job creation that was registered last month uh, has been the highest in France since 2008. So the, the, the highest uh, of the past 10 years. Which is once again a very, very symbolic uh, um, figure uh, because it tells a lot about the confidence. Um, thirdly, uh, we are uh, now the, fir the first country in Europe uh, as far as the number of st startup creation is concerned. Uh, 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 we, we ranked first last year uh, in 2017 with a, with a strong improvement in the increasing in the number of startups being created. 
And I would add that every month, 20 foreign companies take the decision to locate or to relocate uh, their activities uh, in France. It's 20 decisions a month, uh, which has also sharply increased uh, over the past six months. Um, I don't want to be over optimistic, and, and, but I really believe that there is a strong trend upward uh, toward, towards not only economic recovery but, 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 but a, a strong economic dynamic uh, in my country today. Uh, it's not purely magic. Uh, uh, confidence has played a role, as I said, but reforms uh, also. Um, we have reformed our labor law uh, over the past six, uh, the, 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 the last month, uh, the last uh, uh, autumn, just a few months after President Macron uh, took over. Uh, we have reformed our tax system. We have created strong incentives on uh, innovation and uh, uh, on research. Uh, we are transforming our uh, uh, skilling system and our education system. So all these reforms that have been undertaken, some of them a few years back from, from, from now, I'm thinking about the strong incentive we've put in, tax incentive we've put in on research and innovation, for instance, which are usually long-term kind of instruments, uh, but which are paying off now. And I, I, I will add that uh, uh, this dynamic is not only a French one, uh, it's, it's a dynamic that is uh, seen uh, uh, in all Europe. Uh, Germany is obviously part of it. Uh, I think the uh, a, a strong Europe uh, need at least a strong Germany and, 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 and strong France and Germany and France uh, working together, uh, reforming together and I'm quite confident that the two leaderships that, have, that are now in place uh, in Paris and uh, in Berlin uh, will further increase this uh, strong uh, uh, dynamic uh, economic recovery uh, in all Europe. Which is, by the way, um, and by far the first investor uh, in India and the first client uh, of India in the world. Uh, mm. Just to follow up from this, since you talked about st strong Europe, you know, uh, there is now very strong tension between Europe and Russia is playing out right now. And uh, do you think this will have repercussions in the in the kind of overall relationship that you share with Russia? And uh, how do you see the U.S. role in in Europe? Our system has been uh, based. Uh, our international system has been based since uh, the end of the Second World War on uh, certain rules of the game. Uh, multi multilateralism, uh, rule of law, uh, free trade, uh, certain number of uh, norms. And um, we strongly believe, and I think that's the belief we share with India, that the stability of the world uh, will depend on our ability to preserve uh, this system. And, uh, uh, and, and to have it respected uh, all over the world. And I think that's the, the position we are taking, either on individual states or on uh, uh, individual negotiations or multilateral negotiations. 
will always be always be led by this unique preoccupation. That is our conviction uh, that the stability of the world very much depends uh, on our ability to have common norms and common rule of games and that, that we must all respect. Not talking about Russia or about United States or about China or about whatever country in the world, but it's a very general statement that can apply to, uh, to, to many situations, let's say, to, 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 to many situations. Uh, that would apply also to, well, let's say to many situations. <laughs> uh, in, this, in, this, in the string of terror attacks that took place in France, what are the kind of steps or you know measures that were taken? What did you do? What did France do on the social front, on the security front, to kind of uh, avert future such records? Well, as I said, I think there is uh, there are steps that we must. Would you like coffee? No, I'm fine, thank you. No, there are steps that we must take. We must take domestically. Um, uh, like uh, improving the security, uh, deploying more police forces, uh, deploying uh, security forces. Uh, like uh, also. Uh, tackling with uh, this radicalization and with the very roots of this uh, radicalization uh, what we're doing on cyber uh, what uh, um, we're doing on, on, on the youth uh, at school on education there are steps that have to be taken uh, at the European level uh, like uh, steps we've taken on PNR, so on, on better controlling, uh, uh, while not closing our borders, but better controlling uh, passengers traveling from one country to another, or entering, uh, especially into uh, the Schengen area, like better coordinating our security services, our intelligence services between our two countries, between our uh, countries in Europe. And that are steps that have been taken at the European level uh, right after the attacks uh, in Paris, in Brussels, uh, or in uh, other countries in Europe. And there are steps that have to be taken uh, globally. Uh, you were, uh, well, combating uh, financing, uh, which, is, which are usually global network of uh, uh, financing. Uh, cyber is probably a global issue. Uh, uh, trying to detect uh, some certain groups, <coughs> cells, and organizations like uh, like uh, Daesh, uh, working with countries or trying to convince countries uh, that are uh, sometimes uh, haven or safe haven uh, for terror uh, to actively uh, combat uh, uh, terrorism. Um, and we are working on these three directions. So we are taking that. We have taken very hard national measures, very tough national measures. Uh, we have been quite active uh, within Europe uh, with our, all our key partners, and we are engaging uh, into global uh, global cooperation, either bilaterally, what we are doing with India, uh, or multilaterally. Uh, we were mentioning FATF uh, or in some other groups that are specifically uh, dedicated uh, to fighting <coughs> against, against terror. Uh, once again, it's going to be a long-term uh, combat uh, that will require a lot of cooperation globally uh, and especially a lot of cooperation between democracies uh, that are sharing the same values. Uh, Ambassador, you've been here for almost two years mm -hmm. now, and you know this current Indian government prides itself in facilitating ease of doing business. Uh, there have been 
several measures taken mm -hmm. by this government. Um, how do you see what is your impression as French business, you know, is, is coming into doing business here? Well, our impression is definitely that it's moving in the right direction. And if you look at the uh, amount of FDI over the past few years, uh, you should act, as, uh, actually ask our companies. Uh, they, are, uh, they, they, they are the ones who can concretely answer to that, to that question. But my feeling is that they are uh, much more confident in the, in, in, in the strengths of the, the, the partnership they are developing, uh, economically they are developing with India. Uh, that it used to be the case. And obviously, decisions that have been taken uh, on opening uh, more sectors to FDI, on uh, uh, easing investments, uh, decisions that have been taken on creating a, a, a common market in the country, such as, such as the GST, has played, has played a significant role. Uh, of course, there are still margin for progress. Uh, I think access to certain uh, uh, products is still uh, sometimes complicated. The tax level uh, is still high. Uh, we are working on this very openly uh, with the government, uh, either bilaterally uh, or together with our uh, European partner. Uh, we are uh, working on this idea of uh, uh, BIT that would accompany the uh, free trade agreement that we are in the process of negotiating between the EU and and and, uh, uh, and India. We've but been negotiating for almost a decade and it's still stuck. Well, there again, I think it's moving in the right direction. Uh, there have been talks resumed uh, over the over the past months. Uh, it's a complex negotiation. Uh, but I think the dynamic is, uh, is, uh, is uh, here again. Uh, obviously we'd like it to, uh, to move uh, faster, uh, but I think that from both parts dynamic is now here and that negotiations are, are going to, to make progress. Uh, if you take some figures, uh, we have around 500 companies that are, set, that are settled here in India. Uh, 500 companies doesn't mean much to anybody. Uh, probably it means much when you know that it's 350,000 jobs uh, that are directly created by French companies in this country and that the influx of investment uh, coming in every year is around 1 billion uh, per year. So the dynamic is here and it's really, really, uh, really increasing. Even more importantly, um, uh, I always quote this figure, among the top 40 companies, uh, French companies, what we call CAC 40 mm. in France, 25 have settled here in India major R&D uh, centers, centers uh, which is also unique. There is no places in the world uh, where so many major companies, French companies, have settled R&D. And I think it's, it says a lot also on the way we are uh, partnering with this country. Uh, not only are we making in India, but we are innovating in India and we are innovating with India. Uh, you can look at foreign trade figures and, and say, well, oh, it's only 10 billion a year, we, we should reach 20 billion. Of course we should reach more. On, on bilateral trade, but it's only part of the picture, and I really want to, to to stress how important is this uh, influx of not only investment, job creation, but also uh, research and development that we are undertaking in this country, and which is adding much more value uh, than the, the simple figure of uh, our bilateral trade. Before we wind up, I just wanted to ask you one thing, you know, uh, there's so many French-speaking centers of students here, but very few go to France to study. Only about 5,000 Indian students? 5,000. Uh, every year? Yes. So that's... Which is not enough. 
Yeah. So how does France make, you know, enhance that number? Well, that's a very, very good question. And it's a very strategic one. You know, I usually say there's no point in speaking of a strategic partnership for the next 50 years if you don't prepare the generation that will be in command in 50 years from now or even 20 years. And the fact is that we've not done enough. That's for sure. France is the third country in the world, uh, as far as the number of foreign students it attracts to, it, to its universities. So that's one of the very, very strategic priorities we have set to ourselves. Um, uh, we want to double the number of, of Indian students choosing France in the two coming years, before uh, 2020. And I think we're going to achieve that. It's a very ambitious uh, target. And we'd love to double as well the number of French students we, uh, choosing to, uh, uh, to come to India to complete uh, their higher education courses. And the follow-up to very, that. Very limited. So, uh, qu yeah. uh, question. Yeah. Uh, 50 years ago, after English, the most popular. Can I take the mic? Uh, after 50 years ago, uh, uh, after yes. English, the most popular uh, foreign language was French. But today, it's been overtaken by several other languages, whether it's German, Chinese, Russian. What is the reason for that? Because the schools that used to be, uh, you know, the second language. That was on the language, uh, on, 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 on French language uh, uh, issue, uh, there is around uh, half a million uh, uh, Indian people in this country learning French currently, <laughs> either at schools or within our uh, 14 Alliance Francaise or uh, at university. There again, we want to double uh, this number with a clear message. Uh, French language is opening up France, of course, uh, but it's also a window open to currently 300 uh, million uh, French speakers around the world. And in 15 years from now, uh, more than the double of this figure, uh, al almost, almost uh, seven to eight uh, uh, hundred millions, uh, including uh, a lot in Africa, uh, which is today a continent uh, with which uh, India is developing uh, very strongly relation, uh, economic or, 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 or cultural. Mr. Mm. Modi was one of the students at an Alliance France. That's true. Uh, did he exercise his uh, skills in the language with your presence? <laughs> <laughs> I'll not disclose any secrets <laughs> on the conversation the two, <laughs> the two of them had. <laughs> he did use. Uh, but I, I can confirm he was he, 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 he was he was a member of the Alliance Française in Ahmedabad. Absolutely, that's true. That, that <laughs> so, brings us to this, you mm, know, mm, very very mm, interesting and insightful mm, conversation we had with. Mm. Uh, Guest, thank you. Ziegler. Thank you so much for your time. And, mm. and uh, before you go, we'd like to sign. Mm. Uh, mm.